Hi all, I'm Bree. I'm actually going into my third year of my PhD, so I'm class of 2012, which is kind of a strange thing to say. Um, my study is called the Catches Study. Uh, it has a little bit of a pun to it because I row quite a lot, and for any of you who row, uh, everyone knows how important the catch is to all things rowing. If you don't row, I apologize. Uh, it's probably not very good of a lead in. Um, but anyway, I, I study computerized aphasia therapy for chronic aphasia. What are these things? It's a good question. Um, C, computerized. Since about the 1980s, um, speech therapy has been delivered on desktops, on laptops, by speech therapists to people who have issues speaking after their stroke. Happens quite often. Uh, there's about 40,000 cases of aphasia in the UK each year, um, and about 10 to 15 of those, 10 to 15,000 of those will persist into the long term. So people are struggling with speaking difficulties years after having their stroke. It's a well-known uh, occurrence in society. And speech therapists realized this. Computer obviously became popular in the 80s and they thought, you know, why not use this to help deliver speech therapy? Well, the advent of the iPad is now, so same, same idea. Companies are coming up with iPad delivered speech therapy softwares that can be used uh, in the home by these individuals who have speaking difficulties and they don't necessarily have to use it uh, alongside a speech therapist. So it's a lot easier for them to actually do the speech therapy whenever they want. It's a lot cheaper as well. I'll pass around the iPad with it. It does speak, so be careful pushing some buttons. Um, it does speak, so it speaks in American as well. I haven't found the UK version yet. Uh, a, obviously in the catch it stands for aphasia, and we've talked, it's a spoken speech issue that happens after stroke. It can be a comprehending issue, that's what's called comprehensive aphasia. Um, or receptive aphasia, so that's when you have an issue actually understanding what you're told. I'm interested in the other side of aphasia, which we call expressive, which is an inability to um, speak the words as you want. Sometimes it's word loss, sometimes it's an inability to make sentences. Um, it, can, it can really manifest in a lot of different ways. Uh, my T is therapy. It used to be the concept in a lot of recovery research, motor and language, that when you had a stroke, if you didn't regain the function you had lost, rather it was language, rather if it was motor, uh, by six months down the line, you weren't ever going to regain it back. That was the general concept. Uh, past five years or so, um, there's been a ton of research saying that that's actually not the case. You can regain a lot of your motor capacity and your language capacity um, up to 10 years past your stroke. It can, it really, it takes intensive practice, uh, but it's not that six month cutoff that we thought we once had. So there's that ability um, years down the line to actually still make gains on things that you've lost. Uh, and the CH, we've talked briefly as well, aphasia can persist into the long term. So that's more than one year down the line. Uh, we call it chronic, hence why my title has the chronic aphasia. And that really interests me because in the NHS and in the US, um, the ability to get long-term speech therapy is incredibly expensive and it's very, very hard to find. Um, so people in the community are available, there are community speech therapists, but often the waiting line to get into these programs is about seven to ten months after you leave hospital. And if you're sitting at home without any stimulation for seven to ten months, you're not going to make massive gains. You're probably going to plateau yourself a lot earlier than if you were to really try and engage with something. Um, so that's where this iPad comes in. You know, can it be uh, the thing that helps them push their language while they're waiting for speech therapy? Can it actually help in that way? So that's what I'm looking at for my study. Uh, research methodology, uh, you can imagine it's quite difficult to find people with specific types of speech issues um, after stroke because strokes happen everywhere in the brain. Um, I can only look in the part that affects language, which is the left medial cerebral artery area, which you can see up there. So in, in all fMRI images, the right is the left and the left is the right. So the right up there is actually the left. This is confusing, much like the earlier talk of negative and positive. I don't know why we don't make things int interesting and easy to read, but the left is the right. So <laughs> there you go. Um, when we look for these types of people, we obviously have to screen for this, and not everyone fits the criteria, so you can imagine recruitment is actually really quite difficult. So in order to make this worthwhile of a thing statistically, we had to uh, do a crossover methodology. So we get three time points for each person, basically. Bring them in, we get a baseline measurement. How good is your language? How good is your cognition? Um, what's happening in your brain? We send them home with this iPad that's being passed around, uh, either to play Bejeweled, which you all know is the better version of Candy Crush. 
for four weeks. That's a very popular thing. Uh, which is essentially, it, it improves your cognition, but has nothing to do with language. So it's a nice active control so people don't run away when I say go home and don't do anything for four weeks. So it's a, it's a good bit of fun. Uh, they come back, we do some of those tests again, see if anything's changed with their language, see if anything's changed in terms of brain function and language. Then I send them home, they get to do the fun thing, which is the language therapy, which is the thing we're passing around here, which has all sorts of different tasks that give them great feedback on, you know, oh, this time you got ten names right, last time you got two right, and it gives, it gives some good feedback to the person, and it also sends it to me, so I get a sneaky look at what they've been doing. Um, so I can kind of monitor them and make sure they have actually been using it every day as I've told them to. So I can sneak up on them. Uh, and time three, they come back to me at the end and we say, right, uh, let's see how we've looked from baseline, what's changed, both in language and in brain. Um, so what are these behavioral tests? We use the cat, not the kitten, unlike Bo, which is a lot cuter. Uh, we use the cat, which is the comprehensive aphasia test. And it basically looks at some main areas of language. So this is the ability to repeat something you've heard, uh, the ability to name something spontaneously, uh, reading, writing, and the most interesting for anyone with aphasia, spontaneous spoken picture description. The ability to actually speak without having that time to process what you want to say, which is really quite difficult for people. Um, aphasia is really easy to describe, but once you hear it, you understand a little bit more. So I'm going to play for you um, someone who has spoken aphasia, who's describing this picture, which is what I use in my study. There is a bit of like a delay, so just bear with it. Let's see, hope it works. Maybe not. Thinking. Um, in the stool is it a boy is it that landing down a girl is laughing and cookie jar Window, curtains, and the out the uh, garden, and trees, um, low grass. So you can see, it's quite difficult for her to speak spontaneously about this picture. She's actually pretty good with names. She knows certain object names, you can tell, um, but she can't string together a sentence. She has no grammar. And that's something that we look at. Uh, it's called conversation analysis. It's the ability uh, for us to step back and say, right, how good are her quality of sentences now before therapy? You know, how many words has she named? What quality um, of words are they? How rare are those words? And things like that. Um, everyone with aphasia sounds different. Uh, she's quite mild. The people that I work with really struggle to find words. Sentences are amazing if they happen. And so she's, really, she's a really mild version. Um, so the people I work with, uh, you know, Getting, getting this picture description, they run out of words in about 30 seconds to give you, give you an example of how severe it is. Uh, but that gives you a good, good example of what I work with. Uh, so I do fMRI, um, which David really doesn't like, which made me a bit sad earlier. Uh, but fMRI can be quite useful. Uh, we don't use it to look at the time scale of things, which is what he uses, which is understandable why he uses ERP. Uh, we're interested in the space of the brain that things happen in. So, Pre-therapy, we know that they have a massive lesion here in this red part. Okay, so everyone that I work with has a lesion ranging from the entire left side of their head being gone um, to maybe a lesion that's a several centimeters across. So it does vary. Um, but obviously, this is where language processing happens. And when you don't have it, we're interested to know, well, where does it happen? They clearly have some language left. What's going on elsewhere? So we look at it at baseline, and then we look at it after therapy. Has something changed? Has the right side added in? Has something moved to the front? You know, more frontal language is associated with being bilingual, um, having better cognition, you know, what's happening after the therapy. So that's what we look at. Um, and this is just an example of what we ask them to do in the scanner. They basically lie there, listen to nice music, and then decide if two words rhyme, uh, which is actually pretty difficult to do. Right, so our brain scans are currently being analyzed, and they're pretty to look at, but they're hard to interpret, so I thought we'd do a bit more behavioral results. Um, I'm almost done, so don't fall asleep on me yet. But 
At the bottom here, we have those subtests I talked to you about. So we have repetition on the left, uh, naming, reading, writing, and spoken picture. And if you look down the left side there, all those initials are some of the individuals that I've worked with. Now, on that left-hand side are point increases. So that's how much they've changed in their speech in those areas um, from baseline to therapy. Just to give you an idea, because those numbers mean nothing, if they've increased by more than 25 points, they've jumped from being severe to being considered moderate, or from being moderate to being considered mild. So it's a huge jump. So 25 points is a big, big thing. And you can see um, some people have done more than 25. They've jumped two categories from being severe to mild in reading, for instance, just after four weeks of therapy. Um, the one thing to point out is that Mr. NP down here, who's green, he came to me very mild. He, he was a lot like the person you just heard. Um, so when he did the tests, he was almost at ceiling, so he was almost too good for them. But we included him because he was really, really keen. He was great to have in because he wanted to become more familiar with iPad therapy. And he goes to a lot of stroke uh, survivor meetings, so he'd be a great person to really you know, um, get involved with this. Uh, but everyone else was severe to moderate. And you can see on the left-hand side, double, double star means 0.01 statistical significance, which is really, really high. Um, so everyone, with the exception of one person, uh, jumped a massive amount in at least one category, so they kind of upped their ability in at least one category. And also with aphasia, you can see that everyone is really, really different in terms of their phenotype. Um, so really, you can't make a global assumption of this therapy is going to do this for naming or this for reading. Everyone starts at a different baseline, therefore they're going to end at different ones as well. Right, last slide, bear with me. So. The implications, um, I told you earlier, there's 40,000 new cases, which means about 10 to 15,000 persist into the long term. Um, a guy from Scotland went around and in interviewed these people and their families, and he asked them, um, you know, there's a lot of research going on in aphasia right now in the sciences. What do you think are your main priorities? What do you want people to focus on who are doing this research? Um, and they, you know, they said motor, and they said improving quality of life, but twice in their top ten, the only thing that had it twice um, was an issue with speech. So it's a big, big thing for these people. A lot of them went from being salespeople on their jobs to not having any words. And it's, it's a massive thing for them. They want to understand why it's happening, and we obviously want to provide them um, a cheaper, more effective means of actually getting some therapy, which is why we're pushing um, to see what this iPad has to offer. Uh, surprisingly, we've done a lot of brain imaging, uh, we've done a lot of language research in our lives, but we still know very, very little about it. Um, maybe it shouldn't surprise you, being scientists, we always seem to know very little about whatever we study, because there's always more to know. Um, but, you know, this is one thing to add to our interpretation of why we recover language and how we do it. And lastly, I, I told you guys earlier, in the NHS, in the U.S., it's really expensive to get speech therapy privately. And I'm talking about 10, 10 grand a year, um, which is, I mean, incredibly expensive for some people. Uh, so we're saying, you know, if you want to pay a one-off of 500 pounds, if we see that this iPad therapy is actually effective, it might be a really good way to at least get something in while you're waiting for um, cheaper therapy to come around that's run through your community center or something to that extent. So it's not meant to replace human therapy. I think human therapy is a great thing. Um, but it is something to at least spur the brain on because we know that it means something to really keep working um, while you're recovering. So that's it. I hope I was fast enough for all of you. Um, just, uh, I work with a doctor, so medical doctor. She's a stroke consultant over at Addenbrooke's, which means that I get to work with a lot of stroke patients all of the time. So they've given me a lot of insight on what's important to them um, and a lot of takeaway messages that I couldn't have seen just through straight science. So it's been a wonderful thing working there. And I obviously work with a speech language therapist to develop the best means of getting this out to people and getting people to um, be receptive to it, but also to give us great feedback on how to push it forward into the community and things like that. That's it. Thanks. Questions for Brie? Bye. Bye's the king of questions. <laughs> um, do you mind going back to the results slide, please? The brief glimpse at results. Um, a couple, a few things stand out here. Um, yeah. In your sample size, there's only one female and nine males. Yeah. Is is this? Good trend catch. observed in the bigger... Um, this is an overall pattern in all of stroke. Um, 
those who have a tendency to have aphasia, whether it's because women have a bigger language region, which might be the case, um, there's a tendency to be more men persisting into the long term with aphasia. So it's a general stroke pattern. Uh, it's actually it's really difficult to find women with this type of aphasia. I don't know if it's just within the Cambridge surrounding region, um, but it seems to be the case in all of the literature. That's a good spot. Um, you'll also spot that we go all the way up to 46 months. And just to point out who the 46 months people are, it's PF uh, and NP. So you can see PF still made massive gains. He's, what, five, five six years down the line? Um, and NP had already made some big gains. He was a bit too mild. Uh, but that's a good, good viewpoint on that you can still make these big gains some five years down the line. So. Interesting. My, my uh, second and last question is, uh, what are the sort of implications of succeeding? Like, if you're more successful with your iPad therapy, mm. do your chances of getting access to a proper, or not proper, but like to getting access to hospital care decrease? Because are there any implications, sort of negative implications? Because mm. already there are cuts at, in NHS. Community centers are being yeah, shut yeah, down yeah. across this country. And if this is seen as an alternative, I can fully believe the conservative government will say, buy yourself an iPad, stop using our money. Fair enough. Um, I'm hoping to push it as a supplement. I'm hoping not to push it as an alone game, because I don't think it can be an alone game. It, it doesn't get that same quality of feedback that um, a face-to-face -face thing will do. Um, what it has done is it's helped, um, it's helped me and the speech therapists get Adam Brooks to buy us iPads. To help with uh, to help with speech therapy in the wards in the acute phase, so right when they're admitted, right when they can't speak at all, we bring them in there. Uh, so it has done positive so far. I'm hoping there's no negative backlash that says we hate humans, just use iPads, because um, I'd be really quite depressed by that. Uh, but I think I could support. I what I want to do is actually in, not in my PhD, but in a postdoc, I'd love to involve speech therapists in one part of it um, to see if you know a speech therapist interacting with an iPad if that proves even more. Um, not proves, it's proof of concept, if that pushes for even more uh, success on something like this. Yeah. Any other questions? Not from Vi. Yeah, one more. as opposed to mm. with actual human interaction? So a big factor um, with any computerized therapy and iPad therapy is motivation, obviously. So you have to be motivated for this to work. Um, the intensity is the biggest thing. So every person here has used it every single day for four weeks. And obviously, they wouldn't have been able to do that if they weren't motivated. So that's like an, its own separate entity, I think. And it's a lot easier to be motivated if you're in person with someone, because someone can clearly feed back to you and say, you are interested in this. Uh, whereas the iPad, you can just flick it off when you're done. Um, so motivation is a really key thing uh, that you cannot ever push through with iPad. I mean, it's not going to work. You don't have a voice talking to you all the time through your iPad. Um, so that's something else to kind of draw in is that if you get some people who just really don't like the iPad or just aren't, aren't finding it motivating at all, this might not be very nice for them. So it's definitely not a global thing. It's definitely a selective audience, yeah. <laughs> you need a microphone, apparently. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, um, really lucid talk, especially at this time of the evening. Um, <laughs> It's like the biggest compliment I've gotten. That's great. That's okay. um, do you notice any differences or trends? I won't say differences, but yeah. trends in effect size um, with people that um, do the therapy nearer to the time of their stroke compared to further away? Yeah, um, that's something I'm going to look for. So far, it's I, I assumed that it would be a bigger trend. It would be a bigger effect size for people who did it 12 to 20 months after the stroke, so the sooner people, but it's not, which kind of surprises me. Um, it might be purely because we don't understand how fast the brain recovers, which is probable. Um, it also might be a big motivating factor. So the people who were 40 plus months down the line, there are three of them, um, found me. As in, I hadn't advertised my study. They came to me and said, I want this. Um, so it was a very big motivational thing. And I think, you know, they probably used it two to three times a day. Um, so that also could have had an effect. And I wasn't going to tell them, don't use it more than once. So it was very much their own prerogative. But shockingly, no, we didn't see, we didn't see a bigger effect with near, 
And just one more mm. brief question. Do you have, I, I know you talked about this as a, a, as a complementary mm. therapy. Do you have any intentions to compare the iPad-mediated intervention with um, an in-person intervention? Controversial. Uh, only because I don't want to disprove in-person therapy, if that makes sense, because I, I do obviously think it's a good thing. Um, I do want to compare them, but I want to do it in such a way that um, they both look like a benefit, if that makes sense. I don't want to face off like iPad versus speech therapy because I will have people finding me. Um, and telling me I'm wrong. But actually, some people have done this with computerized therapy, and they found that, um, in many cases, speech therapists and iPads look the same, but the type of uh, interaction that happens between them, uh, the people doing the study feel like the interaction is more wholesome, they get more out of the speech therapist, uh, even if maybe the results look the same. And that's an important thing. So you want the people to really feel like they're improving. Confidence is a big thing. Um, so I would like to do that, but carefully. Great talk, thank you. Yeah. Um, this may be akin to comparing apples to oranges, but I'm just curious. So, um, with traditional speech therapy yeah. issues, um, you know, stutter or something else, uh, occasionally I believe in spont spontaneous situations, if you drop a plate, you may get uh, a really good sentence or a string of words. Or if you throw on a pair of headsets and yeah. you sing, then you might get a pretty good song yeah. out of it. Um, do you ever see that? All the time. Of, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so called jargon. Um, PF here, um, he knows one phrase, and it is, yeah, uh -huh, okay, every 10 seconds. Um, but he, he doesn't know he's doing it. But it, it's, it's clear as day. If you were just talking to him in the street and you asked him a question like, how was your day? And he goes, yeah, uh -huh, okay. You would not know he had aphasia. That's because he's picked up that phrase. That's the only thing he can spontaneously utter. Um, with other people, you do find some, some people have jargon. A lot of people say okay all of the time. Um, one person really liked to say, uh, lead every sentence with my wife, even though if he was talking about his dog. It, I don't know. Uh, it's just it's something that you hold in your brain, and it's what people argue is that something's left behind. So that lesion's obviously not going to wipe out your entire language center. There's stuff left behind, and it's those things. Uh, that you've said in your daily life all of the time that have connections elsewhere in the brain that stick. So he's clearly talked about his wife all of the time in his past life, which is adorable. Um, but, you know, when his language center got wiped out, those connections elsewhere in his brain stuck. So he still has that. Um, so it is really interesting to see that because do you consider that spontaneous words? Most speech therapists don't. We consider it jargon and we just kind of, we say it's, you know, it's a phrase, but it's not quality expression, if that makes sense. Uh, but you see that a lot. Yeah. This is may I follow up with one more. Um, uh -huh. This might be slightly outside of the scope of the talk and your research, but I'd be interested mm. in getting your take. So when it comes to strokes, mm. uh, what what are the best hedges we can take right now, particularly as young adults, to avoid this problem? I get this question all the time. Um, they have no idea, right? So they're looking half of <laughs> terrible answer. I know half of my group is looking at genetic predisposition. Um, I know nothing about genetics, so I have no idea if there's anything there. Uh, perhaps I'll let you know in a few years. But other than that, the general consensus is don't do things that are stupid, which is drinking, drugs, tobacco, and stress. Quite literally, though, they, they don't have any, um, any <laughs> real concept of what causes stroke. Unfortunately, Mr. A.B. here um, was on a safari in Kenya, got T-boned by a truck, um, and had a giant clot rise from his heart two weeks later and had a massive stroke at age 45. Um, so it's things like that that you can't really predict, but it's basically just a low stress is the biggest thing people push these days, which makes a lot of sense. So most of them are 70% of strokes are blood clots, and that has a lot to do with, obviously, stress. So, yeah, so don't do that. <laughs> So again, this is a little outside the realm, but That's what about Alzheimer's? Because when mm. you were describing some of the, and when I was listening to that woman yeah. attempting to describe that scene, it was reminding me vividly of my grandma attempting to describe sure. who yeah, has yeah, Alzheimer's, yeah. trying to do something like that, because a lot of the noun retrieval and some of that is, I mean, it, it absolutely like is. You're exactly right. So um, when, we, when we talk language, we talk temporal lobe and frontal lobe, which is basically here and here. So this guy has a nice hole in his, but these are the people I work with. So he has a nice, nice hole in his head, which is all dead space. Um, but 
what your grandmother has and what a lot of people with Alzheimer's have is obviously um, dead white matter tracks that are carrying information back from these places. And so in our frontal lobe, we tend to carry a lot of semantics. So that's things that actually mean things. That's, that's the meaning connected to words. So your grandma might still know exactly what a dog is, have no connection to what that word is. And that's unfortunately uh, what happens in stroke when you're wiped out in the frontal area. Um, it, it's a bit complicated as to why it happens. You know, it could be gray matter, it could be white matter. Um, but essentially, the brain is hardwired to have connections in as many places as possible. But once you lose one critical one, which is a, oftentimes in the frontal lobe, like your grandmother, um, or for my cases, in the temporal lobe, you've lost the ability to find the other ones you had. So you have this massive network, and as soon as the like, critical linchpin is knocked out, you still have the massive network. It's rebuilding them and how to make them talk to each other again. And so in Alzheimer's, it pretty much deteriorates that, unfortunately. And do you think your little therapy could, not little therapy, sorry, it's okay. not no, to it's belong. Fine. It's not mine either, so it's okay. But this therapy, do you think it could have anything to do with, or could potentially be useful for Alzheimer's patients who are struggling with mm. linguistic? It's it hard because Alzheimer's is obviously degenerative, whereas stroke is stagnant. But I think in the short term, when people still have that ability, um, to have a plastic brain, which is you know pretty much up to your 70s and 80s, um, it is, it's, it's at least one way at least to raise confidence and at least to try. Um, so confidence is a big thing with language. And just trying over and over and over and over and building confidence and building rehearsal uh, is bound to work in one way or another. Um, unfortunately, degenerative is really, really quite hard. So it depends how early you catch it. But I think in an early stage, it could be useful. Um, thanks a lot. Yep. Um, do you have any preliminary findings for the neuroimaging kind of changes in structure or function that would maybe mirror the... Yeah, so I should come back and give a talk in like a month and a half. So it's going through, it's going through the tube of things that take forever to process, basically. Um, what we're predicting is something a little bit out of the box. So we like to look at inner speech. So if everyone could just do, do a task for me for a second. So without saying these two words out loud, Say them to yourself in your head. Do they rhyme? So most people with aphasia can do that, but when they read them out loud, they cannot. They, they don't think they rhyme when they read them out loud because they can't produce the words. When they say it in their head, they know they rhyme. So they have this intact inner speech network that is just not coming out, basically. So what we're trying to look for in fMRI is to look for where that inner speech is sitting, and we're predicting it's in a little bit of a different space than the normal language realm. So it's a bit more frontal and a bit more back, if that makes sense. Um, so we're trying to look for a very distinct function of language. So that's what we're hoping to see.